There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with a review of a Victorian novel that I just finished a couple days ago. Cranford by Elizabeth Gaskell. Now this was a bind up. This volume has Cranford and Cousin Phyllis in it. I hate bind ups. Each work of fiction, novella length and up deserves its own volume. So I'm going to put the book down and give you a gif of the cover of Cranford from here on in. I love this so much. It has become my favorite Victorian novel. Published serially in Charles Dickens's periodical. What was that periodical called? Household Words in the very early 1850s and then published in book form in 1853. Cranford is a very different novel than any of Elizabeth Gaskell's other works which I have read. I have read North and South which I quite liked and I have read Wives and Daughters which I loved. Cranford is quite a different kettle of fish. It is set in a country town, set around the 1830s. The scholars have dated the time references. It's around the 1830s. The main action is happening in a small country town, fictional country town, based on Elizabeth Gaskell's hometown, I believe, certainly a, a small town that she lived in for many years in her youth. And the narrator is we don't find out her name until the final page chapters of the book mary smith who narrates it in first person but there's a lot of we narration going on especially at the beginning where she sets the scene about the community that she is a frequent visitor to and has been largely accepted as part of that community cranford something that i didn't really cotton on to is that she's a much younger woman than the somewhat older ladies that she is fraternizing with and most of these ladies I would describe as upper middle class they are poor upper middle class people there are a few aristocratic ladies in the town men are discouraged from being in the town but they keep coming in and getting at first reluctantly welcomed <laughs> by these ladies who are first referred to as the Amazons of Cranford. Um, the novel is virtually structuralist, and to me that is its greatest strength. If you are a reader who likes a tightly woven structure to your fiction, you won't like this novel. And if you are a reader who likes a lot of plot, especially the kind of traditional plot of the Victorian novel and you won't like this. A lot of readers find this book boring and I have to sharply not disagree. I mean everybody has their own tastes but to me this is such a quintessentially heartening Victorian novel that everything else pales in comparison. Mary Smith the narrator takes us into the heart of this community. These women are poor, but they don't talk about their poverty, and they live much more genteelly than they have the money to pay for, and so money is a big part of the story. And they have lived together and visited each other's houses for tea with very established social rituals that are ridiculous, hilarious, and touching in turn. And it at first glance, seems like it's going to be a very superficial novel. And I think to a certain kind of reader, it doesn't go beyond that. A whole bunch of ladies having tea parties together and talking about the good old days. Well, that doesn't do this novel justice for me. In the structureless structure of the novel, guided by this enigmatic narrator who spends weeks and months at a time in Cranford and then goes back to her father in a nearby, I believe, larger town that is more industrial, but keeps getting dragged back for some personal or social reason or other to Cranford where her heart seems to be. We get to know the backstories of so many of these ladies that, for me at least, pulls the reader much more deeply into the lives, the loves, the sorrows of these characters. I can't remember a Victorian novel that has made me chuckle and almost cry as many times as Cranford. I just think it's pitch perfect. It's gentle satire 
because there's a lot of snobbishness going on in the town, and not only in the aristocratic ladies. Through all classes of this small little town, Cranford, there is a lot of pulling rank going on that is narrated in the most hilarious ways, and that extends to things like literature. In the opening chapter, I believe it's the opening chapter, there is a argument that creates tension between a new male resident of the town, Captain Brown, I believe was his name, and the reigning matriarch. Again, she is not aristocratic, but she certainly acts like she is, Miss Jenkins. And they butt heads over literature. Miss Jenkins loves Samuel Johnson, who can do no wrong, and anything that has been written in the 19th century, Dickens especially, is trash. Whereas Captain Brown loves Dickens, and they have a very polite argument about it that reverberates through several ensuing chapters, and it was just an absolute joy, an absolute delight to read. So in a very subtle way, with all of the shenanigans, the social shenanigans, and the effrontery, and the turned-up noses, and social snubs that happen, you can enjoy the stories on that level. But Elizabeth Gaskell pulls you beneath that to see that the narrative arc for many, if not all of these characters, is to transcend their social class and discover something that might be considered modern for their times, which is a much more egalitarian sense of humanity, fellow feeling, neighborliness. I don't think I have much else to say. I thought it was heartbreaking, hilarious, quintessentially Victorian. And let me just read you a very short passage to give you a sense of the writing. This is one three quarters of a page length paragraph about the gentlefolks of Cranford and how they ignored and how it was taboo for them to openly admit that they were not very rich. I imagine that a few of the gentlefolks of Cranford were poor and had some difficulty in making both ends meet, but they were like the Spartans and concealed their smart under a smiling face. We none of us spoke of money, because that subject savoured of commerce and trade, and though some might be poor, we were all aristocratic. The Cranfordians had that kindly esprit de corps which made them overlook all deficiencies in success when some among them tried to conceal their poverty. When Mrs. Forrester, for instance, gave a party in her baby house of a dwelling, and the little maiden disturbed the ladies on the sofa by a request that she might get the tea tray out from underneath, every one took this novel proceeding as the most natural thing in the world, and talked on about household forms and ceremonies as if we all believed that our hostess had a regular servants' hall, second table, with housekeeper and steward, instead of the one little charity school maiden whose short, ruddy arms could never have been strong enough to carry the tray upstairs, if she had not been assisted in private by her mistress, who now sat in state, pretending not to know what cakes were sent up, though she knew, and we knew, and she knew that we knew, and we knew that she knew we knew. She had been busy all the morning making tea bread and sponge cakes. It's an emblematic passage which shows the humor and the conviviality in equal measure. If you are not married to the idea of a all-encompassing narrative arc, if you like novels about little old ladies, if neighborliness and the kinds of emotional breakthroughs and epiphanies that can happen in simple, often somewhat snobbish people and make them transcend their class and their social station. If that kind of thing is moving to you, you must check out Cranford. Thanks for watching.